today to talk about social emotional learning and skills uh, to best support our program staff. Here's our agenda for the day. We talked a little bit about our meeting logistics. And so um, I'm Lauren Mercier and I work for Demonstrated Success. And prior to coming to Demonstrated Success, I spent um, many years in the classroom as a school counselor. And then uh, my last role was in a K-8 school as a director of student affairs. So I supported um, teachers and staff with um, help them manage student behaviors, essentially. So, um, so that's the lens that I generally come from and use when um, I'm working with educators. And Heather Jenkins is also on the call. Heather, do you want to? Say a little something. Yeah, you, um, you probably know me from the other Everybody meetings. Heather. <laughs> mostly, mostly data um, and looking at working together um, to be able to um, help inform um, any of our instruction or teaching, whether it be in a classroom or in the 21st century programs. So I'm happy to be here today. Great. And then if you wouldn't mind, I'd love to, Stacy. can you just refresh our memory in terms of your role and you're in Dover, right? Yep. I'm Stacey Kearns. I'm the program director for the Seymour Osman Community Center, which is part of the Dover Housing Authority. Um, we are 21st century with the CBO as the lead fiscal agent. So we partner with the district instead of kind of the opposite way around. Right. Awesome. Thanks. I'm so glad you're here. And Lola? Yeah, my name is uh, Lola Bobrowski. I am um, the brand new executive director of the Access Winchester program down in uh, the southeast, southwest corner of the state. Um, and yeah, I'm brand new, started as executive director just in August, um, and we're into our sixth week of after school program. Um, we've got a lot of kiddos in our program that are on the spectrum or have any different varying levels of um, behavioral issues and emotional processing. So I am really interested in the social emotional learning stuff, um, getting my feet wet with it and just taking whatever I can back to our program just to continue to improve it. So thanks for putting this on and for recording it because I will share it with my site coordinator later because she could not be here today. So. Oh, great. Awesome. Well, congratulations on your new position. And um, we're glad that you're Thank you. with us here this morning. So let's talk a little bit about objectives for the next hour or so. <clears throat> we'll talk a little bit about um, SEL competencies. So SEL, social emotional learning. And so pretty much we'll abbreviate that throughout. So we'll understand the competency areas. There are five, which we'll talk about. And we'll learn why these SEL skills are important for adults to develop and nurture. And then we'll identify uh, at least three to four strategies to support staff in de developing their own social emotional competency. And so Lola, you sort of just touched upon, um, you know, that you have a lot of students with, you know, some probably high needs, right? And so it's really important um, to think about that as you're thinking about your staff and how you can really best support them. So that's, that was actually a pretty good introduction and um, sort of the reasoning why we're talking about, you know, SEL for staff. All right. So you see this lady, you may have been this lady, you may know this lady, I'm not sure. Um, but just thinking about, you know, what do you see in your programs um, at your sites that perhaps may demonstrate a lagging social emotional skill in your staff? I don't know if you have any thoughts about that kind of off the, off the bat. Um, patience. <laughs> I see patience lacking sometimes and um, in myself as well, which makes it difficult to remember um, connecting with the students on the levels that they are at with their social emotional awareness, um, yeah. getting down on their ball, talking through the problems, finding the solutions. Um, right. But I, I notice that that all stems back from a lack of patience um, and or frustration and chaos, you know how it goes. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. Patience or maybe a sense of overwhelm, right, for some of your staff members as they're dealing with certain things. Um, and there's a lot to do, right? There's a lot to do to, and even if it's just for a few hours after school, I mean, you're catching kids after a really long day, right? And so sometimes 
you know, you, you're, you're meeting people in different places than perhaps a classroom teacher would first thing in the morning, right? So they've already been through their day. They've dealt with a lot. And so now your staff, you know, supporting them on the back end. Yeah. Um, perfect. So um, we know that staff are faced with significant challenges. We've talked a little bit about that and they have a lot of roles and responsibilities, right? In terms of this academic component, right? You have your GEPR measures that you're working towards. So there's, you know, certainly some accountability there for staff. Uh, students have a lot going on personally, as do your staff, right? Socially, and then they're supporting students behaviorally as well. Uh, and we know that you as leaders have a lot of influence on your staff. And so that's why we want to come to you first in terms of offering um, some thoughts and strategies to support your staff. So, you know, as leaders, it's really important for you to model growth and collaboration and really strong social emotional competence. So, you know, developing these skills within yourself too is hugely important. And then offering your staff some genuine opportunities to develop their own social emotional competence is very important. Um, if you think about the time that you have with your staff in terms of your staff meetings, uh, I'm not sure, and we can maybe talk about that in a little bit. I'm not sure how often you have staff meetings and in, in which capacity you're offering them. I know some folks are still offering virtual meetings. Some are bringing staff back together face-to-face. Um, but that certainly does provide um, a nice time to embed some of these strategies and uh, or these practices <clears throat> as you meet with your staff. And then research has shown us that staff, whether it's teaching staff, after school program staff, right, staff are more likely to have a higher level of performance and job satisfaction with well-developed and nurtured social emotional skills, right? So that's um, really important to kind of keep in mind. And to share with your staff too, right? So staff members who do exhibit strong SEL skills and competence um, will really have a nice self-awareness. Um, and that's really important as we're working with our students and our colleagues, right? They're going to be able to leverage these types of skills in their relationships and in those interpersonal dynamics, right? Some of which are going to be stressful. So it's really important to leverage these skills. Um, staff will be outstanding role models, right? So we talk a lot in education about supporting students' SEL skills, but it's really hard to do that if you yourself as a professional do not have finely honed and developed skills, right? It's really hard to support students if you don't have that. Um, we can implement SEL programming. So I'm actually not sure, and I would love to hear from you both. Um, how much SEL programming do you have in your programs? Is it formal, informal? I would say it's mostly informal, mm -hmm. um, and I think a piece of that is um, the push to be more academic feels yeah. like we can't mm -hmm. take the time to focus on the SEL, but we need to do the SEL so that they're in the right space to do the academics. Um, so I would say it's more informal in the forms of like having routine and having like check-ins during yep. snack time. Yep. Great. Yeah. Yeah. I you. would say the same thing on our end as well. It's a lot of, um, we try to, Im I try to implement some of that during our afternoon meeting, um, which we have every day, like Stacy mentioned, working it into routine. Um, <clears throat> and, um, modeling it during behavioral issues for kids and um yeah like like stacy said same over here there's a stronger um desire and focus and urge i think to focus on the educational components um so the social emotional seems to come secondary i think um in just application as it presents itself yeah. throughout the day yeah yeah that's interesting um i think you know, as we go through today and then maybe as we go through the year in terms of supports, I mean, I think um, we have a really unique opportunity to blend SEL and academics at the same time. And we did actually, I know Lola, you weren't with us um, because you weren't with the program yet, but we did touch very briefly upon that in a June workshop we had. So we can certainly come back to that because that's really important um, to be able to 
kind of work on both at the same time, right? So, um, and it is possible and it is doable, but this is a good place to start today, but it's certainly something that I'll put in the back of my mind and, you know, feedback from you all would be really important about um, what more you'd like to see in terms of some SEL um, professional development and how to embed that intentionally into our academic work. So kids are actually getting both at the same time. Um, finally, in, in, I'm sorry, did you say something? Oh, sorry. Oh, no, I thought... sorry. Well, I wasn't muted. <laughs> oh, oh, that's, out. that's okay. Uh, and then finally, you know, in terms of improved relationships with one another and enhanced collegiality, we'll talk a little bit about the significance of collegiality in a few minutes. Um, and then we talked briefly about job satisfaction, but also strong SEL skills for our staff will reduce that overwhelm and the sense of burnout, which we'll also tap into uh, in just a little bit. Ultimately, SEL for staff will create a really nice opportunity to put your adults first, right? And that is really important to do. We can intentionally embed practices that will support the well being of our adult staff. And we can align ourselves right with what our students are learning, right, in terms of SEL. So not every school is teaching a traditional SEL curriculum or a formal SEL curriculum. It's not required to do that. Uh, many are. Um, and so, again, formal curriculum and or also just embedding um, SEL into their day, sort of like you were saying in terms of routines in your programs. Um, some schools are doing that also, so less formal instruction. And then um, SEL will help us build our staff, build necessary skills to hone in on that growth mindset. So in terms of our SEL competencies, I'll give you both just a second to read this. So the Collaborative for Academic Social Emotional Learning is known as CASEL, and it's an organization that's been around for several years, a couple of decades, actually. And they really are sort of the leading organization in social emotional learning. And so this collaborative is really explicit in terms of supporting both students and staff members um, as they work toward um, strengthening their social emotional uh, skills. So I like to just put that in at the beginning, but this is our castle wheel. So you'll hear me refer to castle and this is the wheel. And so these are the five competency areas in which castle deems the most important for our students and our staff to develop and to nurture. And so you have self-awareness and self-management, <clears throat> social awareness and relationship skills, and then responsible decision-making. So we'll take a couple of minutes to talk about, I've separated them by color in the slides. So we'll talk a little bit about these areas and then we'll talk some strategies. So in terms of self-awareness and self-management, this is really all about self, right? So it is helping staff uh, understand their personal and professional values, coming back to purpose, which we'll talk about why that's really important. This is the area where we encourage folks to consider their personal biases, right? And how those biases may impact how we choose to respond to different situations, either with our colleagues or with our students. Um, there's a significance in labeling our emotions. So recognizing our emotions and giving them, giving it a, a proper name and a proper feeling, right? During stressful situations that will help our minds, actually our brain regulate situations a little bit better. Um, strong self-awareness and self-management um, will really help us work through that stress management piece, which I'm thinking folks probably feel on a very regular basis, right? As they're working with kiddos after school. Um, Self-motivate and set goals, also very important. Orienting toward, the op toward optimism, right? Um, that is hugely important, and we'll touch upon that in just a couple of minutes when we talk some strategies. Feeling in control and exhibiting confidence. So I'm going to kind of put that toward um, also in connection with orienting toward the optimism. And so what can we tap into that we actually have control over? Practicing gratitude and, of course, asking for help is hugely important, right? That's a very important skill to hone in on. In terms of the social awareness and the relationship skill building, right? So that's that people side of things, right? We want to make sure that 
Um, our staff are culturally sensitive to the makeup of your program, right? And so that looks different in different communities, right? But making sure that your folks really understand sort of the makeup of your community, where are our kids coming from, right? Um, this is perspective taking, right? An asset-based lens. So similar to sort of that orienting toward the optimism and the asset-based lens, we're really going to hone in on what is positive about um, the situation that we're working in. What can I take that's positive about a colleague, right, or and or students? So uh, this is the empathy piece. So we're going to listen and interact with empathy. We're going to view behavior as communication. And we'll talk a little bit about this, right, responding versus reacting, and then what to do afterwards, right? So that's that concept of repairing something. Um, either with a colleague or a student. Problems and solutions are here. Um, developing trust and meaningful relationships, right? That is really going to be at the core of all that we do uh, in our field, right? Whenever we're working with humans, right, we have to hone in on relationships. Modeling positive and healthy ways to have relationships, hugely important. And you all, right, um, as leaders have a, a really important role in that. And then cultivating a positive cl classroom atmosphere, um, classroom program, right? I mean, I know you're working in smaller groups, so, you know, cultivating the positive there and then helping folks exhibit strong management skills. And then finally, the responsible decision-making section is sort of analyzing those dynamics and the impacts um, that situations have in your program setting, right? Creating balance with your students. We're going to talk in a couple minutes about the cost of caring, right? And then explore what it means to have a safe enough and a healthy enough relationship with our students. And we can even take it um, and apply that to relationships with colleagues. And we'll talk a little bit about that. Again, responding and reacting um, versus reacting, this comes again in responsible decision-making. So there's a little bit of overlap, right? In between some of these indicators, setting limits, setting boundaries, evaluating our relationships, our roles and responsibilities. And then, you know, the, the practice of saying no also comes into this category as well. Any questions so far? Okay. So let's talk uh, some high leverage practices right here to support our staff. All right, so in this first category is that orange category, the self-awareness and self-management. We're gonna talk a little bit about reconnecting to purpose, shifting our mindset to regain control, and then the concept of mindfulness. So we'll hone in on those areas. And again, if you have any feedback or questions, just unmute and let me know. So this is a practice, uh, reconnecting to purpose. And so, in this practice, um, there's an opportunity for staff to self-reflect, to hear from colleagues, to empathize and to be vulnerable with one another, right? To really build some relationships here. Um, this would be an opportunity for you as leaders to take time in a staff meeting to ask some fairly pointed questions of your staff, right? And we know that we've heard from folks and I'm not sure where your staff is um, coming from in terms of if you have teachers on your staff or if you have um, some, some programs we know have teenage staff members, right? So it sort of runs the gamut of experiences, but we do feel like you can take this strategy and apply it to any staff member of any age, really, in any background. Um, embedding this type of practice could be sort of a ritual that you come to during a monthly meeting that you have. And one, you know, you could put a, some questions in a jar or a cup and have people draw from. You could have a question of the day in terms of your meeting. It could be your meeting warm up, right? And so these are some of the questions that will help reconnect people back to their purpose, right? And you yourselves may even feel like some of these questions are really helpful. So it may be asking folks, you know, why did you go into this work, right? Why do you stay in this line of work? You know, what gets you to show up day after day? And hopefully there is an opportunity to sort of dialogue here and tap in, right? Um, to kind of go deeper with folks. Uh, if, they give you a pretty simple answer, you know, you can dialogue with your whole staff about that. Um, what is the most rewarding to you? I mean, sometimes I feel like when we work with students in these stressful types of situations, though they're very rewarding, um, it does 
help to come back to what is so rewarding, you know, like what excites you, what makes you happy, um, what makes you feel good about, about this position. And then that question of what do you want to achieve in this work and encouraging some of that goal setting with your staff is really important. And for you as leaders to come back to these types of questions, you know, sort of that progress check, right? See how folks are doing uh, through the course of your school year. So this is a really important, um, this is a really important strategy to, to utilize, right? With your, with your staff members. In terms of shifting mindset and regaining control, this is also an exercise that does connect right back to that sense of developing purpose and understanding your purpose. It affords your staff an opportunity to sort of shape their job around what is meaningful, hone in on what is meaningful, um, again, orient toward the optimism. So we're going to find something positive here that we can hone in on. And then keep this, this strategy keeps your focus on what you can control versus what you cannot control. Right. So here's a couple of examples for you. Um, so like things beyond our control. Um, I, there's a parent example. There's a student exposure to trauma example. Right. So like that is very overwhelming for staff. That can be very challenging for staff to work with students with some extreme behaviors. Right. Um, so one thing that would be within your control would be your program environment. And then further to develop meaning into your program environment, you actually do have a lot of control uh, in the way you choose to build community, the way you choose to create a sense of belonging for your students, right? Um, the way you choose to use your language, right? So language is one thing that educators and staff any staff who works with children have complete control over language, right? And sometimes we we forget what we have control over, but language is one of the most powerful things that we can control, our own language, right? So that's um, that's something to really hone in on and, and making sure that um, we're firm and flexible with students, we're friendly, right? But yet we can set boundaries with our students if something happens, we keep a neutral tone, right, to address our students. So there's a lot of control that we uh, can exercise uh, in the language that we choose to use, right? Um, and then, of course, strategies that I would choose to use with my students. I have control over that, right? I can pick meaningful things. So this is really an exercise when folks say, oh, I don't know, there's nothing I can do about it right, about a situation, a program mandate, for example. Well, what can you really extract from that that actually is within your control? Probably your attitude about it, the effort you choose to put into it, right? Um, so these are just some examples. I'm sure you can think of some other things that folks may feel are out of their control. Um, there's a worksheet that you can use. There's this example, but then there's some space for you to practice this with staff. And again, this is something that you can come back to during your meeting times. You don't have to dedicate a whole meeting on this, but these are just some samplings that you can embed um, because we know that you actually probably don't have a ton of time with staff. So these are some quick things that you can do. I think it's worth noting too that the last, you know, probably three or four slides that we've been talking about here and sort of what is in our control. Everything that is on these slides is um, phrased in a positive way. Even those, you know, questions that Lauren was saying you can ask for your staff, it is what brings you here? Why are you coming here every day? Not why do you not want to come here? Not why. So it's just continuing to focus on those things that are, uh, are positive about situations and things like um, Lauren was saying are in their control, I think is really helpful for, for staff to, to create and, and to have um, the ability to do. It's really hard right now. <laughs> yeah. No, thank you for sharing that. It's, it's, it's true. Um, mindfulness is another strategy for self-awareness and self-management that will really help our staff manage stressful situations with students. And so, as you may or may not know, you know, mindfulness is a mental state that we can achieve by focusing our awareness to a 
to the present, right? To what's to the present moment, what's going on right now, um, honing in on feelings, honing in on our thoughts, honing in on how our body feels like sensations in the body, right? Um, and so this is a really important practice that of course you can use with students as well. Um, when we talked about the indicators a few slides ago, we talked about this, the importance of um, naming, like labeling our emotions, right? And so this mindfulness is a place where we come back to that, right? I feel overwhelmed today. I feel frustrated today. Um, I feel mad today. I'm angry today, right? And so being able to label that and not pass judgment on it is really important because we will all feel overwhelmed. Your staff will all feel overwhelmed. They're all going to feel frustrated at times. And so this is really an allowance for folks to feel the way they feel, right? Now, it doesn't mean you're not going to do your job, right? Because we have some other things we can put in place that we've been talking about, right? In terms of some strategies, but it means that you just can allow yourself to have a feeling. You can allow your staff to have a feeling, right? And not judge it, right? There's no right or wrong. This is where you're at right now, but we need to move. We're going to move forward. And of course, here are some ways that you can do that, right? But it's it's okay to have the feelings and it's okay for your staff to, to have, to feel it, right? To feel the feels, right? Um, and so it's really paying attention in a systematic way um, that's really important to manage these stressful situations. So this is really all connected back to your brain, right? And so this is an image of the brain. And so this is sort of that thought about fight or flight, right? And so this is the amygdala here. You can see it um, at number one. And it's really, um, it's like a, the alarm system in our brain right? And so it detects when it doesn't like things, right? That makes you angry, frustrated, scared, right? Um, and so that's that's sort of our alarm that that's going to let us know like, oh, something's not right here, right? Um, and then this hippocampus area is number two, and you can see it. And it's really critical for our learning and for memory, and it helps to regulate the amygdala, right? So those two pieces are working together. And the front of the brain, which is that prefrontal cortex, helps to regulate our emotions and behaviors. So if you were to do like a hand model, you'd see it's right here. And here's our prefrontal cortex coming over. This is like the limbic region, right? And it's coming right over the amygdala, right? And so it's sort of that thought about like when you flip your lid, like you're totally out of control, right? And so this is a calm brain, right? This is a learning brain. We can learn here. We can communicate well with others when we're here. And that's that sense of fight or flight out of control, right? And so a well-developed brain, right, is one that we can focus, we can pay attention, uh, we can have compassion for others and work through difficult situations. And we can also, when we're here, right, have a sense of reduced anxiety and reduced stress, which is really, really important. So mindfulness has a direct connection to our brain and our brain function. So it's really important to consider embedding a practice like this um, that will help regulate uh, our bodies and our minds. Here are some strategies. This again will come to you in the form of a, um, a worksheet so that this will talk a little bit further about these strategies more in depth. Mindful breathing, you probably, if you have a smartwatch, right, or a phone app, there's that wheel, that circle, that's the inhale and the exhale, right? So that's that mindful breathing that you can do. Um, offer your staff an opportunity to do that. You could open up a staff meeting with some mindful breathing. You could close with a mindful breath or two. Um, there's an exercise in here about compassion um, and perspective taking, right? It's 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 a step by step on on how you practice that because sometimes that's hard for folks to take perspective, uh, and so there's an exercise there um, for you about taking perspective and honing in on compassion for others. Journaling, an opportunity to encourage your staff to journal, right, um, with situations that may upset them or may excite them, right? Um, a body scan is an opportunity for folks to um, go through, you could go toes to head, head to toe, and you're really focusing in on awareness at each of the body parts as you move through sort of that intentional um, 
awareness as you move through uh, as a, and you're scanning from top to bottom, bottom to top. And then tapping is a strategy where you hit different um, points on your body, trigger points on your body um, that help release some stress and tension in the body. And um, again, there's a step-by-step -step for you there. But these are things that you could choose to try with your staff and then encourage staff to bring it back to students. So you may have mindful breathing month, right? So you're gonna take a month and you're gonna hone in with your staff and your students on this strategy of mindful breathing. There's a ton of different breaths that kids are practicing in school. If you ask them, they'll probably share that with you. Um, but if not, you could teach them, right? There's, if you would like some different ideas, I'm happy to give them to you other than just the circle breath. Um, but you could, again, you can, you could choose one of these things that you're interested in, bring it to your staff first, and then encourage and challenge your staff to bring this to your students, right? So it becomes part of your practice of your program for adults and students alike. We really like the five, four, three, two, one activity where you go senses. through all of your senses and the yep. kids really seem to like it. I've even had them like when they're escalated, like hiding under a table and kind of at the end of my rope, like, I don't know what to do. I don't have any more strategies to kind of pull out of my, you know, my back pocket. And they'll finally look at me and be like, I just need five, four, three, two, one. Okay, then let's do it. Let's do and it. then like they immediately deescalate, which is really fun to watch. Yeah. Yeah. That's a really nice. Five, four, three, two, oh, sorry. I'm just wondering what that strategy is. Five, four, three, two, one. Do you want to share Stacy? Yeah. So um, you could go through all of your senses with them. So it kind of helps bring them back to the present moment. So you'll say, what are five things that you can see? What are four things that you can hear? What are three yeah. things that okay. you can feel? Two things that you can smell, one thing that you can taste. And I'll even change the, the yeah. order of the senses with the exception of taste. Taste is a hard one, unless it's like right after lunch or right after snack, right. Um, but it brings them back into the present. Yeah. 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 I love that thing. Yeah, that's great. I think that's a great strategy. Um, that actually may or may not be on the list that I sent, but it's, we have it somewhere. So if it's not on that one, we can definitely add it because that's a, that's a great one there. Um, thanks for sharing that. Uh, social awareness and relationship skills, a couple of things here to think about in terms of fostering collegiality with folks, peer recognition, and then um, the concept of staff buddies. I'm not sure if you are comfortable sharing. I mean, how, how many staff members do you all have? Just out of curiosity. Um, I have myself, my site coordinator, and three staff, uh, activity staff right now, with one more coming on. So <clears throat> I think I'm somewhere around 30. Because we have a lot of like part time. Yep. Okay. Yeah. So some small programming and then a larger, I mean, that's a lot of staff, right? 30 is a lot of staff. Um, even a handful is a lot of staff, right? To coordinate right now. So, um, you know, I think I'd like you to consider and think about, you know, how does your staff, how do your staff engage right now? How do they interact? Um, what are their dynamics like sort of as we go through the next couple of slides? Um, in terms of collegiality, you know, this is really a very essential component of um, effectiveness of your program, right, for your staff success and for student success too, right? Um, collegiality in your staff will foster professional growth and friendship, right? Moral support, um, somebody that you can go to, feeling like you can go to folks, right, to help with stress. Um, again, we come back to job satisfaction. So a lot of these a lot of these pieces, right? You know, when we are well developed socially and emotionally, we we have space for work, right? We can do our work, we can feel good about our work, we can like our work, and that's really important. Um, so you you've seen that that's come up a couple of times here, right? Um, back again to connecting, we're connecting back to purpose and meaning, right? So when I feel like I have friends at work, when I'm well connected at work, um, you know, I can feel like I belong there, right? And I'm accountable for student success just as much as my colleagues are. We are working together. Um, collegiality also can help foster creativity in folks. And then that sense of a self or collective efficacy. So 
I just kind of briefly touched upon that, but that's that belief in self. Like I believe that I can make an impact with students, that I can impact their learning. I can impact in a positive way, their social emotional growth. And then collectively with my colleagues, we can make an impact. We make a difference uh, and we can affect students learning, right? So that's that idea of both self and collective efficacy. Um, so I'll ask you, I'll turn it back to you as, a, as leaders, you know, what are ways that you foster collegiality among your staff? So I asked before kind of like how many staff members you have. So how do you foster it? You know, how do you work with staff so that all members of your community are seen and heard? And then, you know, consider how you would show praise or appreciation. I'd just love to hear what you have to say. Um, I'll jump in, I guess, because I've got the small staff. So <laughs> this has kind of been um, super central. Everything that we're talking about here has been really central to the way that I've been trying to foster um, collaboration and community among my staff. Um, one of the things that we, we do try to do and I encourage at the start of each day is um, just before the kids are coming in or any time before that, we um, I check in with my staff just kind of a, how are you feeling today um, to, in the case that, you know, someone is just had a rough night's sleep or is just that, you know, having some struggles and needs that extra support. We always try to start our day with that so that the rest of the staff can know, hey, Kevin over here, whoever it may be, is really struggling today. So let's try to pick up some slack so that he can take it a little easy because um, burnout is a very real thing. Um, and when I do, I also try my best to, I've been trying to show appreciation to the staff through small gifts. So um, on a tough day, I'll send someone out and get everybody coffee um, to get us going. Or we do appreciation staff meals um, as well on occasion. So um that's just one thing. I, I mean, I have examples where I myself have broken down in tears. My staff have broken down in tears. So also moments like that where I can allow, I allow them to have space mm -hmm. to feel their feelings um, and to recompose themselves um, if they're tired and need like a 10 minute break. I, I really centralize um, supporting mental health <laughs> in my space. So um those are a couple ways. For sure. Thank you. Um, so majority of my staff are coming straight from the school day. So they're doing bus duty, dropping kids off at buses, bringing them out to parent pickup, all kinds of things. So I encourage them to take their time coming down, like stop and go to the bathroom because you haven't had a chance to do that mm -hmm. all day. Like, so right. encouraging them to do that. Um, Encouraging them to take time off when they need it. If, you know, no matter how many staff, as long as I can figure out how to be within ratio, if someone says, I just need a day off, mm -hmm. I'm not going to give them grief for it. Um, unless it puts me in a position that I'm going to be out of ratio and it's not going to be safe. And then I'll be like, yeah, is there any way you could take tomorrow instead? Like I've already got X number right. of staff out, especially if it's someone who's like consistently needing that time, but also they're consistently needing that time because there's something going on. And then when we hit the next session, I'll be like, Hey, so you were taking every Wednesday off. Do you want to just schedule Wednesdays off? Like, right, right, right. Let's react and respond and be proactive instead of reactive every week. Uh, I've been sharing more with staff about the big picture and the grant and a lot of the information that you've been sharing with us and a lot of that data, which up until now, first, we didn't have the data. Um, and I didn't think that they wanted it. I didn't think that they, that it, you know, I thought they wanted to just work with the kids and kind of use their assessments of where the kids were at, what they needed. And they were like, no, we really want a lot of the information that is kind of driving mm -hmm. what we need to do. So that's been an interesting shift. Mm -hmm. um, and then we also, this year, I started an MVP for every month and it's mm -hmm. voted by the staff. Nice. I like that. Yeah. Um, two points, that last point, the MVP, we're going to 
there's a little strategy in here um, that we'll talk. So you'll you'll know where I'm headed with that um, that idea. But in terms of sharing the information, I mean, that's paramount, right? And now you have so much more information and data at your fingertips. I mean, that really just gives people, talk about meaning, right? And perspective. I mean, that right there is like, why are we, why are we doing this? Right. Well, because this is, I mean, it, so it's one data point, right? But it's really a significant data point, right? That we're, we're looking at. And it gives some perspective about how our students have been doing, you know, sort of historically and how we got here, right? So that also helps me do my job better when I understand background, right? When I have more background knowledge. So I, I think that's great that your staff is excited about it and feeling really positive about having more information. Um, this is sort of an MVP thought. You could do it monthly. You could do this weekly. You could do this bi-weekly. But essentially, this is this concept of peer recognition. So if you were to choose an object or something that was meaningful to your program, if you have a program mascot or if you had whatever, a special coffee mug that, you know, it's basically, it's just something tangible that can be passed around. But it's really a vehicle. You're using this as a vehicle to share something good right? Good work in the community, um, positive attitude, right? And so you could um, start it yourselves, right? And then have staff sort of like you're doing, Stacy, if they vote formally, or if it's just my turn, because I've received something that I can choose someone else. So it's essentially encouraging your folks to look out for all the goodness that's going on around them, right? And eyes open, right? Wide, and just really take in the good things that people are doing, right? Together. Um, and so you receive this object, right? And then you place it in a space that can be seen by your students. So you can talk about that with your students. It's also a practice that you could initiate with kiddos as well, as long as I would encourage you to have your staff find an opportunity for every student, right? To eventually receive, just like you would with your staff, right? You want to see the good from all the staff eventually, um, but it really does promote appreciation of one another, community building, and just really simple kindness, right? Uh, staff buddies is another one. And um, and I don't even think, Lola, your, your organization is too small for this at all. You could do it. But essentially, it's it's strategically pairing people up. And that would come from you, the leaders, right? And um, you would offer an opportunity for someone to have a staff buddy, whether it be on a quarterly basis or a semester basis or a full year. And it's really just somebody that you know is checking in on that other person, right? Perhaps leaving a note if they have a staff mailbox, a quick text, an email. But it's just knowing that someone's around to kind of keep their eyes on you. You're keeping your eyes on other people as well right? Promoting that friendship and, and support and connection. And then finally, responsible decision-making. So here we're talking again, we're going to do a whole workshop on, on um, behavior through the lens of restorative practices in November, so next month. Um, but essentially, this is, this is kind of a, a, a lead into that, but we're talking about for your staff to encourage them to respond versus react to behavior. Right. And so we as adults need to influence behavior rather than manage it or control it. Right. And it's it's really important that we encourage our adults to observe students, to listen to what they're saying and to explore. Again, we'll talk about this further, but to explore an antecedent and a consequence. So that is really encouraging your staff members to consider what's happening before a behavior and what's happening after a behavior, right? What happens then? So not a consequence like it's a punishment, but a consequence of, well, this happened because of the behavior. So before, antecedent, before the behavior happens and then the consequence. And then we are going to consider our staff to understand, and this can, this needs to kind of come from you too, is the leaders like, what is the function of our students' behavior? Right. And so this is something that's really important for staff um, to also be working on. Right. And to be available to help look back and and examine what the function is of behavior. Right. Uh, again, we talked a little bit before about our own biases. So this is an opportunity. So when I'm responding, right, I'm considering how my biases may impact how I view a behavior or I view a situation with a student. Right. And that will help me respond versus react to it. 
uh, and then consider personal triggers. So here's a trigger cycle that I'm going to show you, um, which is true with our adults, right? And so in, in this cycle, before we even get to feelings, right, we always come at things with our self-concept. And then we all have a belief system. So those two components have a part in how we respond to or react to situations with our students or with our colleagues, right? And that's really important. So you can see that um, there's generally a stressful situation that happens, right? That's escalating. We feel the feelings during the situation, there's some type of observable behavior that's going to come in and then there's a reaction and, and, and that really works in a cycle, right? So I've given you an example of a student throwing a pencil across the room, right? The teacher or the program staff is very frustrated. They're res they feel resentment because this kid, here we go again, is throwing the pencil across the room. He doesn't care what I have to say. I've worked hard to develop this program for my students today. It's a really cool activity and we've got pencils flying, Right. And so we may yell at the student, we might storm over, we may grab something from the student, right, as adults, because there's just, just had enough, right? Uh, we may send the student out, get rid of the student because we don't want the student in the room anymore. They've ruined my activity, right? And then sort of, you know, you're not feeling good about it. Here's the feelings, right? We react to it. We don't feel good about it. We may be embarrassed, our students don't feel good about it. They may be embarrassed. They may be fearful to come back in. They may harbor some more resentment. So it works in this cycle, but, but all of that kind of has to, it comes into play with our self-concept, right? I'm a lousy disciplinarian. I lack control. I can't manage situations, right? I've got kids throwing pencils. It comes back to that feeling about self, right? And then it may have some impact on your belief system, right? You may have some staff that are just saying, well, this is too hard for me. It's way too hard. I cannot manage this, right? Or kids don't care about this. They really don't want to be doing this work, which is not true, right? But that might be our belief system. So this is an example, uh, and we'll give you a, just a worksheet with this too that you can explore. But this is an example of how that um, trigger cycle works. Um, again, just some more information on reacting and responding, right? When we react, it's very instant right? Fight or flight. When we respond, we're more thoughtful. We consider what we say. We consider our response. Um, and we don't take things personally. And then of course, this will come in in November when we talk too, but we're going to repair, right? In every instance we have with adults or with students, we have to repair, right? We have to come back to our relationship and acknowledge what's happened so that we can move forward and not harbor resentment. Um, with one another, right? The cost of caring, this is very curious. Um, I've done some research on this in the last year. Um, this is actually a term that's real and it comes from bearing witness to supporting students, right? Through their own challenging behaviors and struggles. And I think educators across the board, whether you're in the classroom or you're in a program after school are dealing with the, this, this very concept. Right. And this is really truly the emotional and physical toll that caring for children <laughs> who have experienced trauma, high stress, we know that all of them have now, right after the pandemic, and some have dealt with it in different ways. Right. Um, so it's, it's vicarious trauma, right? It's not your trauma, but it's trauma through others. And so from this sort of comes this concept of compassion fatigue and then burnout. And so this compassion fatigue is, is emotional or physical exhaustion, right? And it's caused by empathy. Like we're constantly caring for our students, right? And for these situations, um, this could be linked to, for your staff members to one incident or incidences over time, right? And it's like this low level, it can be this low level of chronic like clouding, like caring for others chronically. You've been at this for a long time and situations just are building and there's been a lot, right? A lot of student stuff that comes your way that you have to manage that can be a lot for folks. And then burnout is, is exhaustion, right? It's a cumulative process. So remember the compassion fatigue could be considered like one incidence, 
but this is like this cumulative process. It's increased with, in, um, it's associated with increased workload, institutional stress, which probably you might have in your programs in some way or another, right? Not necessarily related to trauma, right? It's just this over time and it can co coexist with compassion fatigue. So this sort of all is this like this, impacts this cost of caring. And when our adults are in these places, we actually see a decrease in student achievement and an increase in student behaviors, an increase in student disconnection, right? Uh, we see some poorly managed programs or classrooms. Um, we may, if it's a school building, we may have higher discipline referrals. If it's an after school program, if you have referral process, you may see an increase. You may also see teachers at their, or program staff at their wits end, sending kids out right, from an activity. Um, we have adults who have a hard time building relationships, negative language, negativity, bring everybody down, um, and that lack of collegiality and efficacy that we talked a little bit about before. Um, so I'm going to pause on this question for you because we, we're going to wrap up, but I would like you to consider um, how, even for you personally, perhaps, how the cost of caring uh, has impacted your professional career, right? Um, and think about how you might have worked through that with different feelings of stress and overwhelm and sort of, you know, how you worked your way through that um, is something that's really important to reflect on, uh, especially if you've been in the line of working with students for, for a while now, right? Um, or managing adults. <laughs> um, setting boundaries is really important. Right, we wanna make sure that we encourage our folks to set boundaries um, and consider this concept of safe enough, healthy enough, which I will tap into, it's one of our last slides. Um, when we have safe enough relationships, we can provide consistency and predictability. We can be positive, we can engage positively with others and we can conduct ourselves with integrity, right? When we have healthy enough relationships, we can model and engage appropriate interpersonal behaviors and we can initiate repair when needed. So it's not possible for our staff members to have hundreds of really deep, meaningful relationships with our students. It's That's a big ask, like we can't do that. And even you yourselves probably can't have these really truly in-depth relationships with all of our kids and you don't need to right? You have to just consider this concept of, is this relationship safe enough and healthy enough, right? And with that, you can create boundary. And that's really, really important uh, to encourage our staff to do. They cannot be everything to every student, right? Unplugging, right, is, an, is a, uh, a nice boundary setting activity. So this has to come from you folks too, right? So um, some people, you know, for example, they might set up their work email on their phones, right? Maybe you do too. I don't know. Um, but this is an idea that maybe you don't set it up on your phone, right? Um, because maybe you decide I'm only going to check my email during these certain hours. I'm not checking on the weekend. Sometimes it really can be disturbing if you get this parent email, right, um, at eight o'clock at night or some parents up at 4 a.m. and they send a blast and it's right by your nightstand and ding, you read it and it really just sets you for the day, right? And that can happen to your staff too. And so it's just an opportunity to consider what boundaries you can put around communication, um, especially with parents. And then especially for you as program staff, you know, to really have a boundary of when you communicate with people, right? If you are somebody that sends a weekly email on a Sunday night, um, you could consider putting a time uh, timer on that email, right? And you can create your email, you can set that timer, and then you can walk away and it'll be in somebody's inbox in the morning. So that's just something for you to consider in terms of your boundary. And then again, self-care um, for, for your folks, right? Some nutrition, good nutrition. If you have a staff meeting, you can model that, right? You can bring your snacks in. Um, I think Lola mentioned coffee, which is lovely. Uh, exercise, uh, some meditation. We talked a little bit about mindfulness as a piece of that. Um, opportunities for really good professional development and training for your staff to make sure they're equipped with what they need. And then opportunities for supervision. So that's for you to supervise and to, not in a evaluative sense, but to get in there and really look at what folks are doing 
afford them an opportunity to ask you for advice, for questions, how to navigate situations, and then encouraging your staff to provide that peer supervision as well. I'm really struggling with this student. What do you think? And asking a staff member. So again, coming back to collegiality and relationships. That's it. We whipped through it. So um, real quickly, is there something that you might take with you back to your folks, back to your program? Um, so we are having our first formal staff meeting this week. <laughs> so pretty much I'm, I'm really excited to connect back to this stuff with my staff. Um, we talk a lot about this stuff on a day-to-day -day basis, but the question examples you gave for reconnecting to purpose, um, I'm really excited about and also introducing some mindfulness techniques. Um, Great into the into the staff meetings and so it's not all just so heavy like hey here's this scenario we need to go over and here's this rule we need to go over i really love this idea of, of working this stuff in and it's funny because i thought this workshop was going to be about applying it to students and um i really appreciate this approach because like you had mentioned at one point um developing developing it within the staff then allows them the opportunity to impart it onto the students more naturally and holistically so Great. thank you this has been amazing you're welcome good i'm glad you could join yeah start with your start with your adults first and work backwards <laughs> yeah stacy any thoughts um i think for me um my big takeaway is like I started by saying it, I feel like we don't have the opportunity to really be like intentional about mm -hmm. like focusing on SEL mm -hmm. um, because of the push to be academic, but needing to be. And I think just this is a reminder that we have to be intentional about SEL in order to do the academics. Like we have to find ways to incorporate it in both amongst ourselves and for the students. Otherwise we're just on a, a wheel spinning around. Yeah. 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 It's, it's a good, it's a good point. So even just choosing something small and simple, like, a, you know, a question to open up with or a mindfulness strategy to open up with um, may just help get you on that trajectory, you know, for embedding a little bit more SEL in. It's definitely could be a challenge, but your staff may actually eat it right up and appreciate it too, you know, especially after long days, if they're all coming to the classroom and if they knew that there was a practice they could look forward to. I be. also like the safe enough and healthy enough. Of yeah. We want to be everything for every student, but we can't. Correct. Um, and so just keeping that perspective. And like, I just had to make a really tough decision of a student's not able to come because we can't keep him safe. Mm -hmm. And so as difficult as that is, it's it's safe enough is for him to not be with us right now until he's able to be safe. So I really liked that perspective and reminder too, of we can only do so much. And as long as we're doing our best, then we're doing the best for the students. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Well, good, I, I think that's great. I mean, email at any time with any questions. And again, in next month, I beginning of November, we're doing um, a beha more behavior and restorative practices. So. That'll be a little bit more so in terms of student supports, Lola, but again, we will be talking about the idea of responding and reacting and repairing um, also for the adults. So we'll, we'll dive a little bit deeper into that, but um, yeah, so here's some resources for you. I'll, we'll send you this tomorrow. And then these are our emails. They're also on the slide deck, but I think you guys know how you can reach us. Um, so I'm going to close out the meeting.